Today we have a very special guest with us, Harry Surdon. Harry is a professor of law at the University of Colorado, specializing in the intersection of law and technology, particularly in areas such as artificial intelligence and computable law. Associate Director of Stanford's Codex, esteemed author and speaker. Uh, you participated in Stanford's few last hackathons. There are a lot of tools presented over there, developed over there. How do you assess these tools? Are they just some overlays on ChatGPT or Cloud extensions? Or we see new tools with new capabilities, new functions, how the legal AI world is developing in the States? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say most of them are overlays on ChatGPT uh, or Claude, but that's actually a good thing because okay. these underlying models are so good and so general, you almost wouldn't want anything else. Because um, when you, you have, you know, so the way I think about it is you have a couple classes of systems. You have the old machine learning systems, and, and by old, I mean prior to 2022, which are very good at particular narrow tasks. So you have a very specific task, whether, you know, maybe it's like predicting weather or classifying images or documents. So one of the big things in law was, you know, trying to find documents that were relevant to a particular case or irrelevant, right? This are something called um, you know, automated discovery, right? So these were sort of very narrow systems. And then in 2022, you have what are known as these general systems. They've read basically everything and they can give you a pretty good answer just about anything you ask them. And if you give them the proper documents or the proper context, they can provide knowledge and reasoning uh, provided that they've seen something roughly like that before. So these are the frontier and there's only basically three of the best models out there. There's uh, GBT 4.0 for, as you said, from OpenAI. There's Claude 3.5 Sonnet, which is now probably better, in my opinion, than GBT 4.0 from Anthropic. And there's Gemini from Google. And then there's a kind of class of lesser models that aren't as good. So I wouldn't use those lesser models. But using these, what I call frontier models, which are the best of the best, they cost hundred a million to a billion dollars to train. But this expense shows because they're just really good. So building on top of these super capable models is probably the best way to go. And uh, there's still a lot of promise to be taken out and a lot of ways to distinguish yourself, basically to help lawyers build workflows that cause the lawyers to get the most accurate results and to prevent the lawyers from accidentally making mistakes or using the models in ways where they don't succeed. So that's what we're seeing a lot of the hackathons, which are kind of putting wrappers around these workflows, which are genuinely useful to lawyers because they're leveraging the strongest AI models out there. So let's discuss the limitations of LLMs. You mentioned there are a lot of limitations. Uh, I've discussed these limitations with some previous guests. Also, these tools, these extensions, overlays uh, show that they are going to mitigate all those limitations probably. So what create most difficulties to implement uh, LLMs in our legal world? Okay, this is a great question. So, and and this, I'm trying to do AI education because to understand what the limitations are for, for your users, it's helpful to understand how these systems work because it actually tells you exactly what their limitations are going to be in the real world. So, uh, one of the most important limitations has to do with the aspect of these large language models called pre-training. So, in pre-training, they, in fact, the P in GPT stands for pre-training. And this was a technique where you just release these uh, algorithms, these neural network machine learning algorithms on basically the entire internet, all of Wikipedia. They've read all the legal opinions that are out there in, in multiple languages. And over time, these systems pick up patterns. Uh, they pick up patterns in common legal decisions. They pick up knowledge. They pick up patterns of reasoning. And it turns out that a lot of things that happen in the world happen over and over again in kind of similar ways. So I, you know, so one of the classes I teach is uh, copyright law. A lot of copyright co uh, cases look roughly similar to one another. Uh, also, I teach tort law, which is accident law. 
a lot of these uh, cases look roughly similar. So these systems have seen patterns of similar cases over and over again. And computer scientists call this being in distribution. If the model has seen something similar before, if you at, give it a scenario that's like something it's seen before hundreds or thousands or millions of times, it's gonna give you a really strong answer because it's seen all the various permutations and it's going to know it. Uh, however, if you give it something that is just different enough from something it's probably seen, uh, it's going to tend to follow the pattern of the thing it's seen before and may lead you down a bad path. So this is the problem in law, for example, asking an easy case that, you know, kind of a common slip and fall case in the United States versus something that's more complicated that has a nuance or some socially contested value, like a social issue, like abortion rights or things like that. And you need to develop this instinct to what's a thing that the system has seen before. It's going to give you a reliable answer or what's kind of something that it's going to give you an answer, but it's outside what it's seen before. And it's going to give you a bad answer because the thing it's giving you doesn't reflect the complexities or the nuances or the differences for uh, of what your particular case is. So that's a really important intuition that lawyers should develop. Uh, otherwise, they're going to be steered. So that's, that's one limitation. Um, another limitation has to do with its knowledge. So they're kind of, uh, right now at least, there are sort of two ways to interact with a large language model like chat GPT. You can ask it a question outright. So say, you can say, you know, here is a movie, say The Godfather in the United States, tell me when its copyright expires. And what it will largely do is look internally to all its different so-called parameters. And these are basically the patterns that it learned during, pre, during months of pre-training, reading all the internet, and it'll give you an answer. And the answer might be good, it might be bad, but there's a much more reliable way of doing that. And that's by giving it the context that is likely to contain the answer upon which it can make a decision. So if you were to say, well, I know where the copyright rules are, they're really long, you know, they're 20 pages long, I can't really read them or understand them but myself, but I'm, before I ask my question, I'm gonna give it to ChatGPT in the prompt, and then I'm gonna ask the question, but ChatGPT, it, this sort of background contextual information will anchor its answers uh, in a much more reliable way. So rather than looking only internally to what it's seen on the internet, it'll look upwards to what you've given it, and it's uh, much more likely to provide a good answer. So this is another limitation that lawyers might not understand, because it seems like just asking questions are going to give you a good answer, but you really need to give it the relevant context to increase the accuracy of the answer, and that's not always apparent. And a lot of these systems are now invisibly in the background, kind of doing searching, trying to get the relevant information for the user, giving it to the model in the background, but that doesn't always work as well. Um, some other uh, limitations have to do, so we can do basic reasoning and problem solving pretty well, um, but not perfectly. So you really, again, it has to do with this in distribution, out of distribution. If it's the type of problem that the model has seen uh, variants of before, it's going to do a pretty good job. If it's just hard enough that it's outside something it's seen before, it's going to give you an answer, but the answer might be bad uh, and the reasoning might be bad. Um, and then, of course, people are very familiar with hallucinations. I think that's a problem which is improving, but hallucinations are when the model will make up really plausible seeming things. And these, it's really good at making up things that sound really realistic that are not realistic. So it can make up the name of a law review article or a case citation and give you information about things that didn't exist uh, because it's seen so many examples of things that are like this. So you need to do some double checking. That problem, I don't think it'll ever go away fully, but it's being mitigated thanks to some of these verification techniques that check the model's answers and use knowledge bases like you were talking about earlier.
I would add or comment uh, your your observation that uh, what I'm afraid is lack of courage. In judicial system, we, we lawyers are, are taught to be courageous. So if we have a tool that supports us saying, I've seen this 100 times, so do the same way as 100 times uh, previously, I will not probably be courageous enough to, to find this maybe the, the only one or the first uh, different case uh, that, that uh, happened. And it's maybe it's not all so often, but it happens sometimes that we have a precedent that that should change the the previous view on on the law. Uh, but what do you think about black box effect, the lack of explainability of ChatGPT or Claude or large language models? Uh, can they be used to, even although we don't know how they work? Uh, yeah, that's a great great question. So I think we need to be cautious about the black box black box nature. Um, one actually way to help with this is through improved prompting. So um, you can actually ask the large language models to at least give its best try about some of the assumptions it is making when coming to its conclusion and also to give you uh, various perspectives that might not be obvious to you. So this is actually one of one of the strengths of large language models. So instead of saying, um, tell me when the godfather expired under co US copyright law, you can say, uh, here, you know, the best practice would be, okay, here's the rule set. Uh, tell me what you think. And also tell me any assumptions you're making and give me also some different perspectives on this. And now you're actually having the large language model give you lots of information upon which you can make an informed decision. And this is actually an improvement over the state of legal decision making today, because you often aren't able to see uh, assumptions that are being made or giving yourself different perspectives that you can't think of. Uh, that being said, the model's uh, own articulations of its assumptions and different perspectives is not it's it's shown to be somewhat accurate, but not fully accurate. Something sometimes the model just tells you things about its assumptions that don't actually reflect what's going on under the hood. Um, I think there is improvement into some of the research into helping us understand large language models. In fact, Anthropic is doing a really good job. There's a researcher there named Chris Ola who's doing amazing work. I suggest you uh, look at his work. I think the black box nature of large language models is something that is going to be vastly improved in coming years. So I'm not as concerned about that because it seems like there's ways to make progress on that based upon the current research, even though today it is much less transparent. So last question, how do you see the future of AI regulations impacting the use of AI in law? We have this AI Act that states that judicial or law enforcement procedures are high risk or judicial enforcement supporting systems are of high risk. A friend of mine sent me an Israeli bar regulation requiring to reveal all the cases when you use AI in the advisory uh, or, or some legal process. As, as an attorney. So how do you predict what can happen in our legal world uh, about the use of AI? Yeah, this is a great question. So on the one hand, I am very sympathetic to the idea that we should have regulations around some of these issues. However, one thing I'm very skeptical of is the idea that we should regulate just for the sake of regulating. I'm a big believer that we should regulate for specific known problems that are happening and then with approaches that we think are likely to solve those problems. And that's not what we're seeing in AI. Um, rather, what we're seeing is sort of this illusory proactive regulation for uh, problems that might or might not arise in the future. And that is actually really bad. The, so people who study, so I, I'm not a big fan of the EU AI Act or some of the regulations that are going on in the United States that propose regulation, not because I think regulation is bad or unnecessary. Rather, I think this specific regulation is really misguided and is very likely to do much more harm than good. And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of this. So uh, the EU AI Act was actually 
written largely uh, before ChatGBT came out. So it contains this framework that is risk-based and asks users, uh, creators of AI to identify the uh, common risks associated with their technologies, you know, uh, that ways might affect users. That was not an unreasonable approach back in 2019 when we had these narrow AI systems that had very specific uses in very specific cases, you know, sort of maybe predicting credit scores for loans, things like that. The world has really changed since 2022 with large language models. We now have these general purpose systems that can be used almost anywhere. But notably, the AI Act did not budge. The regulators stubbornly continued on the world of 2018, uh, imposing this world model that almost uh, is meaningless or uh, causes more harm in the world of general purpose AI. And this is sort of an emblematic of uh, the problem of regulating uh, AI um, before you really have specific problems and that are addressing with specific tools. Uh, rather, what I think is going on are people are regulating for the sake of regulating out of fear and uh, fear of problems that might arise. And that is actually worse than not because when the time comes when certain problems arise, it's hard to muster the political capital to address those specific societal problems or to think up solutions. So a good example of this in the United States has to do with uh, social media. So in the United States, um, you know, social media has created uh, a bunch of problems, uh, political misinformation and mental health issues. Uh, and there was this idea that we should be, you know, 10 years ago, proactively preventing a bunch of problems that we were predicting at the time. But the problems they were predicting at the time were very different than the problems that actually arose. And now there are sort of arguments, well, we need to regulate, we need to regulate but we don't actually have very good solutions to those problems using regulation. So you need to make sure that you actually have good approach, regulatory approaches to the problems rather than regulating for the sake of regulating. So I think actually what we need is a lot more research into effective policy tools and also really importantly, being paying attention a data gathering on what are the actual problems caused by AI or other technologies in society, not sort of feared problems of the future that may or may not arise. I fully agree. This is why we have conducted this uh, this research and uh, and made this global report on the state of AI in legal practice to see how lawyers perceive uh, AI, but also how they use, what fears, what obstacles, uh, or what use cases they they see or they have uh, experienced. So now we are preparing the second edition to to see how how it developed and uh, if there are other use cases, other fears, other obstacles, or other ways to to help them and support them with AI. Harry, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your incredible insights. It, it's been a fascinating discussion and I'm sure listeners have gained a lot from your expertise. For those interested in diving deeper into Harry's work, uh, be sure to check out his latest papers. I will link uh, below this episode. I will link also his videos uh, below this episode. Uh, follow his contributions to the field of AI and law. Thank you again, Harry. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all your excellent uh, scholarly work in this important area as well. Thank you. Goodbye, our listeners. Stay tuned for the next Monday Bible episode. See you.